Book Three, Chapter Nine of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jordan. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo, Book Third, in the year 1817, Chapter Nine: A Merry End to Mirth. When the young girls were left alone, they leaned two by two on the window sills, chatting, craning out their heads, and talking from one window to the other. They saw the young men emerge from the Café Bombarda, arm in arm. The latter turned round, made signs to them, smiled, and disappeared in that dusty Sunday throng which makes a weekly invasion into the Charmes Alliés. "'Don't be long,' cried Fontaine. "'What are they going to bring us?' said Zephine. "'It will certainly be something pretty,' said Dahlia. "'For my part,' said Favourite, "'I want it to be of gold.' Their attention was soon distracted by the movements on the shore of the lake, which they could see through the branches of the large trees, and which diverted them greatly. It was the hour for the departure of the mail coaches and diligences, Nearly all the stagecoaches for the south and west passed through the Champs Elysees. The majority followed the quay and went through the Passy barrier. From moment to moment, some huge vehicle, painted yellow and black, heavily loaded, noisily harnessed, rendered shapeless by trunks, tarpaulins, and valises, full of heads which immediately disappeared, rushed through the crowd with all the sparks of a forge, with dust for smoke, and an air of fury grinding the pavement, changing all the paving stones into steels. This uproar delighted the young girls. Favourite exclaimed, What a row! One would say that it was a pile of chains flying away. It chanced that one of these vehicles, which they could only see with difficulty through the thick elms, halted for a moment, then set out again at a gallop. This surprised Fontaine. That's odd, said she. I thought the diligence never stopped. Favourite shrugged her shoulders. This Fontaine is surprising. I am coming to take a look at her out of curiosity. She is dazzled by the simplest things. Suppose a case. I am a traveller. I say to the diligence, I will go on in advance. You shall pick me up on the quay as you pass. The diligence passes, sees me, halts, and takes me. That is done every day. You do not know life, my dear. In this manner a certain time elapsed. All at once Favourite made a movement like a person who is just waking up. Well, said she, and the surprise? Yes, by the way, joined in Dahlia, the famous surprise? They are a very long time about it, said Fontaine. As Fontaine concluded this sigh, the waiter who had served them at dinner entered. He held in his hand something which resembled a letter. What is that? demanded Favourite. The waiter replied, "'It is a paper that those gentlemen left for these ladies.' "'Why did you not bring it at once?' "'Because,' said the waiter, "'the gentleman ordered me not to deliver it to the ladies for an hour.' Favourite snatched the paper from the waiter's hand. It was, in fact, a letter. "'Stop,' said she. "'There is no address, but this is what is written on it. "'This is the surprise.' She tore the letter open hastily, opened it, and read, she knew how to read, Our beloved, you must know that we have parents. Parents, you do not know much about such things. They are called fathers and mothers by the civil code, which is puerile and honest. Now, these parents groan, these old folks implore us, these good men and these good women call us prodigal sons, they desire our return, and offer to kill calves for us. Being virtuous, we obey them. At the hour when you read this, five fiery horses will be bearing us to our papas and mamas. We are pulling up our stakes, as Bosway says. We are going, we are gone. We flee in the arms of Lafitte, and on the wings of Caliar. The Toulouse diligence tears us from the abyss, and the abyss is you. O oh, our little beauties! We return to society, to duty, to respectability, at full trot, at the rate of three leagues an hour. 
It is necessary for the good of the country that we should be, like the rest of the world, prefects, fathers of families, rural police and councillors of state. Venerate us, we are sacrificing ourselves. Mourn for us in haste and replace us with speed. If this letter lacerates you, do the same by it. Adieu. For the space of nearly two years we have made you happy. We bear you no grudge for that. Signed, Blacheville, Famuil, Listoyer, and Felix Tolomier. Postscriptum, the dinner is paid for. The four young women looked at each other. Favourite was the first to break the silence. Well, she exclaimed, it's a very pretty farce all the same. It is very droll, said Zephine. That must have been Blachevelle's idea, resumed Favourite. It makes me in love with him. No sooner is he gone than he is loved. This is an adventure indeed. No, said Dahlia. It was one of Tolomier's ideas. That is evident. In that case, retorted Favourite, death to Blachevelle and long live Tolomier. Long live Tolomier, exclaimed Dahlia and Zephine. And they burst out laughing. Fontaine laughed with the rest. An hour later, when she had returned to her room, she wept. It was her first love affair, as we have said. She had given herself to this Tolomier as to a husband, and the poor girl had a child. End of Book 3, Chapter 9 Recording by Jordan Book 4, Chapter 1 of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book 4. To confide is sometimes to deliver into a person's power. Chapter 1. One mother meets another mother. There was at Montfermeil, near Paris, during the first quarter of their century, a sort of cook-shop which no longer exists. This cook-shop was kept by some people named Thénardier, husband and wife. It was situated in Boulanger Lane. Over the door there was a board nailed flat against the wall. Upon this board was painted something which resembled a man carrying another man on his back the latter wearing the big gilt epaulets of a general, with large silver stars. Red spots represented blood. The rest of the picture consisted of smoke, and probably represented a battle. Below ran this inscription, At the sign of Sergeant of Waterloo, O Sergeant de Waterloo. Nothing is more common than a cart or a truck at the door of a hostelry. Nevertheless, the vehicle, or to speak more accurately, the fragment of a vehicle, which encumbered the street in front of the cook-shop of the sergeant of Waterloo, one evening at the spring of 1818, would certainly have attracted by its mass the attention of any painter who had passed that way. It was the forecarriage of one of those trucks which are used in wooded tracts of country, and which serve to transport thick planks and the trunks of trees. This forecarriage was composed of a massive iron axle-tree with a pivot, into which was fitted a heavy shaft, and which was supported by two huge wheels. The whole thing was compact, overwhelming, and misshapen. It seemed like the gun-carriage of an enormous cannon. The ruts of the road had bestowed on the wheels, the fellies, the hub, the axle, and the shaft, a layer of mud, a hideous yellowish daubing hue, tolerably like that with which people are fond of ornamenting cathedrals. The wood was disappearing under mud, and the iron beneath rust. Under the axle-tree hung, like drapery, a huge chain, worthy of some goliath of a convict. This chain suggested not the beams, which it was its office to transport, but the mastodons and mammoths which it might have served to harness. It had the air of the galleys, but of cyclopean and superhuman galleys, and it seemed to have been detached from some monster. Homer would have bound Polyphemus with it, and Shakespeare, Taliban. Why was that forecarriage of a truck in that place in the street? In the first place, to encumber the street, next in order that it might finish the process of rusting there is a throng of institutions in the old social order which one comes across in this fashion as one walks about outdoors and which have no other reasons for existence than the above the centre of the chain swung very near the ground in the middle 
and in the loop, as in the rope of a swing, there were seated and grouped on that particular evening, in exquisite interlacement, two little girls, one about two and a half years old, the other eighteen months, the younger in the arms of the other. A handkerchief, cleverly knotted about them, prevented their falling out. A mother had caught sight of that frightful chain and had said, "'Come, there's a plaything for my children.' The two children, who were dressed prettily and with some elegance, were radiant with pleasure. One would have said that they were two roses at mid-old iron. Their eyes were a triumph. Their fresh cheeks were full of laughter. One had chestnut hair, the other brown. Their innocent faces were two delighted surprises. A blossoming shrub which grew near wafted to the passers-by perfumes, which seemed to emanate from them. The child of eighteen months displayed her pretty little bare stomach with the chaste indecency of childhood. Above and around these two delicate heads, all made of happiness and steeped in light, a giant forecarriage, black with rust, almost terrible, all entangled in curves and wild angles, rose in a vault like the entrance of a cavern. A few paces apart, crouching down upon the threshold of the hostelry, the mother, not a very prepossessing woman, by the way, though touching at that moment, was swinging the two children by means of a long cord, watching them carefully for fear of accidents, with that animal and celestial expression which is peculiar to maternity. At every backward and forward swing the hideous lynx emitted a strident sound which resembled a cry of rage. The little girls were in ecstasies. The setting sun mingled in this joy, and nothing could be more charming than this caprice of chance which had made a chain of titans the swing of cherubim. As she rocked her little ones, the mother hummed in a discordant voice a romance then celebrated. It must be, said the warrior. Her song and the contemplation of her daughters prevented her hearing and seeing what was going on in the street. In the meantime, someone had approached her, as she was beginning the first couplet of the romance, and suddenly she heard a voice saying very near her ear, You have two beautiful children there, at madame. To the fair and tender Imogene, replied the mother, continuing her romance. Then she turned her head. A woman stood before her, a few paces distant. This woman also had a child, which she carried in her arms. She was carrying, in addition, a large carpet-bag, which seemed very heavy. This woman's child was one of the most divine creatures that it was possible to behold. It was a girl, two or three years of age. She could have entered into competition with the other two little ones, so far as the coquetry of her dress was concerned. She wore a cap of fine linen, ribbons on her bodice, and Valsienne lace in her cap. The folds of her skirt were raised so as to permit a view of her white, firm, and dimpled leg. She was admirably rosy and healthy. The little beauty inspired a desire to take a bite from the apples of her cheeks. Of her eyes nothing could be known, except that they must be very large and that they had magnificent lashes. She was asleep. She slept with that slumber of absolute confidence peculiar to her age. The arms of mothers are made of tenderness. In them, children sleep profoundly. As for the mother, her appearance was sad and poverty-stricken. She was dressed like a working woman who is inclined to turn into a peasant again. She was young. Was she handsome? Perhaps, but in that attire it was not apparent. Her hair, a golden lock of which had escaped, seemed very thick, but it was severely concealed beneath an ugly, tight, close, nun-like cap tied under the chin. A smile displays beautiful teeth when one has them, but she did not smile. Her eyes did not seem to have been dry for a very long time. She was pale. She had a very weary and rather sickly appearance. She gazed upon her daughter asleep in her arms with the air peculiar to a mother who has nursed her own child. A large blue handkerchief, such as the invalide use, was folded into a fichu and concealed her figure clumsily. Her hands were sunburnt and all dotted with freckles. Her forefinger was hardened and lacerated with a needle. She wore a cloak of coarse brown woolen stuff, a linen gown, and coarse shoes. It was Fantine. It was Fantine, but difficult to recognize. Nevertheless, on scrutinizing her attentively, it was evident that she still retained her beauty. A melancholy fold, which resembled the beginning of irony, wrinkled her right cheek. As for her toilette, that aerial toilette of muslin and ribbons, which seemed made of mirth, of folly, and of music, full of bells and perfumed with lilacs, had vanished like that beautiful and dazzling hoar-frost which is mistaken for diamonds in the sunlight. It melts and leaves the branch quite black. Ten months had elapsed since the pretty farce. What had taken place during those ten months? It can be divined. After abandonment, strange circumstances— 
Fantine had immediately lost sight of Favourite, Zephine, and Dahlia. The bond once broken on the side of the men, it was loosened between the women. They would have been greatly astonished had any one of them told them a fortnight later that they had been friends. There no longer existed any reason for such a thing. Fantine had remained alone, the father of her child gone. Alas, such ruptures are irrevocable. She found herself absolutely isolated, minus the habit of work, and plus the taste for pleasure. Drawn away by her liaison with Tholomais, to disdain the pretty trade which she knew, she had neglected to keep her market open. It was now closed to her. She had no resource. Fantine barely knew how to read, and did not know how to write. In her childhood she had only been taught to sign her name. She had a public letter writer indite an epistle to Tholomais. Then a second, then a third. Tholomais replied to none of them. Fantine heard the gossip say as they looked at her child, "'Who takes those children seriously? One only shrugs one's shoulders over such children.' Then she thought of Tholomais, who had shrugged his shoulders over his child, and who did not take that innocent being seriously, and her heart grew gloomy towards that man. But what was she to do? She no longer knew to whom to apply. She had committed a fault, but the foundation of her nature, as will be remembered, was modesty and virtue. She was vaguely conscious that she was on the verge of falling into distress and of gliding into a worse state. Courage was necessary. She possessed it and held herself firm. The idea of returning to her native town of Montreux-sur-Mer occurred to her. There, someone might possibly know her and give her work. Yes, but it would be necessary to conceal her fault. In a confused way she perceived the necessity of a separation, which would be more painful than the first one. Her heart contracted, but she took her resolution. Fantine, as we shall see, had the fierce bravery of life. She had already valiantly renounced finery, had dressed herself in linen, and had put all her silks, all her ornaments, all her ribbons, and all her laces on her daughter, the only vanity which was left to her, and a holy one it was. She sold all that she had, which produced for her two hundred francs. Her little debts paid, she had only about eighty francs left. At the age of twenty-two, on a beautiful spring morning, she quitted Paris, bearing her child on her back. Anyone who had seen these two pass would have had pity on them. This woman had in all the world nothing but her child, and the child had in all the world no one but this woman. Fantine had nursed her child, and this had tired her chest, and she coughed a little. We shall have no further occasion to speak of Monsieur Félix Tholomès. Let us confine ourselves to saying that twenty years later, under King Louis-Philippe, he was a great provincial lawyer, wealthy, influential, a wise elector, and a very severe juryman. He was still a man of pleasure. Towards the middle of the day, after having, from time to time, for the sake of resting herself, travelled for three or four sous a league in what was then known as the Petite Voiture des Environs de Paris, the little suburban coach service, Fantine found herself at Montfermeil, in the alley of Boulanger. As she passed the Thénardier hostelry, the two little girls, blissful in the monster swing, had dazzled her in a manner, and she had halted in front of that vision of joy. Charms exist. These two little girls were a charm to this mother. She gazed at them in much emotion. The presence of angels is an announcement of paradise. She thought that, above the sin, she beheld the mysterious here of Providence. These two little creatures were evidently happy. She gazed at them, she admired them, in such emotion that at the moment when their mother was recovering her breath, between two couplets of her song, she could not refrain from addressing to her the remark which we have just read. "'You have two pretty children, madame. The most ferocious creatures are disarmed by caresses bestowed on their young.' The mother raised her head and thanked her, and bade the wayfarer sit down on the bench at the door, she herself being seated on the threshold. The two women began to chat. "'My name is Madame Thénardier,' said the mother of the two little girls. "'We keep this in.' Then, her mind still running on her romance, she continued humming between her teeth. "'It must be so, I am a knight, and I am off to Palestine.' This Madame Thénardier was a sandy-complexioned woman, thin and angular, the type of the soldier's wife in all of its unpleasantness, and what was odd, with a languishing air which she owed to her perusal of romances. She was a simpering but masculine creature. Old romances produced that effect when rubbed against the imagination of cook-shop women. She was still young, she was barely thirty. If this crouching woman had stood upright, 
her lofty stature and her frame of, of an arambulating colossus suitable for fairs might have frightened the traveller at the outset troubled her confidence and disturbed what caused what we have to relate to vanish a person who is seated instead of standing erect destinies hang upon such a thing as that the traveller told her story with slight modifications that she was a working woman that her husband was dead that her work in paris had failed her and that she was on her way to seek it elsewhere in her own native parts that she had left paris that morning on foot that as she was carrying her child and felt fatigued she had got into the Villemobile coach when she had met it that from Villemobile she had come to montfermeil on foot that the little one had walked a little but not much because she was so young and that she had been obliged to take her up and the jewel had fallen asleep at this word she bestowed on her daughter a passionate kiss which woke her the child opened her eyes great blue eyes like her mother's and looked at what nothing with that serious and sometimes severe air of little children which is a mystery of their luminous innocence in the presence of our twilight of virtue one would say that they feel themselves to be angels and that they know us to be men then the child began to laugh and although the mother held fast to her she slipped to the ground with the unconquerable energy of a little being which wished to run all at once she caught sight of the two others in the swing stopped short and put out her tongue in sign of admiration mother thénardier released her daughters made them descend from the swing and said now amuse yourselves all three of you children become acquainted quickly at that age and at the expiration of the minute the little thénardier were playing with the newcomer and making holes in the dirt which was an immense pleasure the newcomer was very gay the goodness of the mother was written in the gaiety of the child she had seized a scrap of wood which served for a shovel and energetically dug a cavity big enough for a fly the gravedigger's business becomes a subject for laughter when performed by a child the two women pursued their chat what is your little one's name cosette for cosette read euphrasie the child's name was euphrasie but out of euphrasie the mother had made cosette by that sweet and graceful instinct of mothers and of the populace which changes josepha into pepita and francoise into Celette. it is a sort of derivative which disarranges and disconcerts the whole science of etymologies we have known a grandmother who succeeded in turning Theodore into Non. How old is she? She's going on three. That's the age of my eldest. In the meantime, the three little girls were grouped in an attitude of profound anxiety and blissfulness. An event had happened. A big worm had emerged from the ground, and they were afraid, and they were in ecstasies over it. Their radiant brows touched each other. One would have said that there were three hoods and one aureole. How easily children get acquainted at once, exclaimed Mother Thénardier. One would swear that they were three sisters. This remark was probably the spark which the other mother had been waiting for. She seized the Thénardier's hand, looked at her fixedly, and said, Will you keep my child for me? The Thénardier made one of those movements of surprise which signify neither assent nor refusal. Cosette's mother continued, You see, I cannot take my daughter to the country. My work will not permit it. With a child one can find no situation. People are ridiculous in the country. It was the good God who caused me to pass your inn. When I caught sight of your little one, so pretty, so clean, and so happy, it overwhelmed me. I said, Here is a good mother. That is just the thing they will make three sisters. And then it will not be long before I return. Will you keep my child for me? I must see about it, replied the Thénardier. I will give you six francs a month. Here a man's voice called from the depths of the cook-shop not for less than seven francs, and six months paid in advance. Six times seven makes forty-two, said the Thénardier. I will give it, said the mother. And fifteen francs in addition for preliminary expenses, added the man's voice. Total, fifty-seven francs, said Madame Thénardier. And she hummed vaguely with these figures. It must be, said the warrior. I will pay it, said the mother. I have eighty francs. I shall have enough left to reach the country by traveling on foot. I shall earn money there, and as soon as I have a little, I will return for my darling. The man's voice resumed. The little one has an outfit? That is my husband, said the Thénardier. Of course she has an outfit, the poor treasure. I understood perfectly that it was your husband. And a beautiful outfit, too. A senseless outfit, everything by the dozen, and silk gowns like a lady. It is here in my carpet bag. You must hand it over, struck in the man's voice again. "'Of course I shall give it to you,' said the mother. "'It would be very queer if I were to leave my daughter quite naked.' The master's face appeared. "'That's good,' he said. The bargain was concluded. The mother passed the night at the inn, gave up her money, and left her child. 
fastened her carpet-bag once more, now reduced in volume by the removal of the outfit, and light henceforth, and set out on the following morning, intending to return soon. People arrange such departures tranquilly, but they are despairs. A neighbor of the Thénardier met this mother as she was setting out, and came back with a remark, I have just seen a woman crying in the street, so that it was enough to rend your heart. When Cosette's mother had taken her departure, the man said to the woman, "'That will serve to pay my note for one hundred and ten francs, which falls due to-morrow. I lacked fifty francs. Do you know that I should have had a bailiff and a protest after me? You played in the mousetrap nicely with your young ones.' "'Without suspecting it,' said the woman. End of Book Four, Chapter One. Recording by Melissa. Book Four, Chapter Two of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Fourth. To confide is sometimes to deliver into a person's power. Chapter Two. First sketch of two unprepossessing figures. The mouse which has been caught was a frightful specimen, but the cat rejoices even over a lean mouse. Who were these Thénardier? Let us say a word of two of them now. We will complete the sketch later on. These beings belong to that bastard class composed of coarse people who have been successful, and of intelligent people who have descended in the scale, which is between the class called middle and the class denominated as inferior and which combines some of the defects of the second with nearly all of the vices of the first, without possessing the generous impulse of the working man nor the honest order of the bourgeois. They were of those dwarfed natures which, if a dull fire chances to warm them up, easily become monstrous. There was in the woman a substratum of the brute, and in the man the material for a blackguard. Both were susceptible, in the highest degree, of the sort of hideous progress which is accomplished in the direction of evil. There exist crab-like souls which are continually retreating towards the darkness, retrograding in life rather than advancing, employing experience to augment their deformity, growing incessantly worse and becoming more and more impregnated with an ever-augmenting blackness. This man and woman possessed such souls. Thénardier, in particular, was troublesome for a physiognomist. One can only look at some men to distrust them, for one feels that they are dark in both directions. They are uneasy in the rear and threatening in front. There is something of the unknown about them. One can no more answer for what they have done than for what they will do. The shadow which they bear in their glance denounces them. From merely hearing them utter a word or seeing them make a gesture, one obtains a glimpse of somber secrets in their past and of somber mysteries in their future. This Thénardier, if he himself was to be believed, had been a soldier, a sergeant, he said. He had probably been through the campaign of 1815, and had even conducted himself with tolerable valor, it would seem. We shall see later on how much truth there was in this. The sign of his hostelry was an allusion to one of his feats of arms. He had painted it himself, for he knew how to do a little of everything, and badly. It was at the epoch when the ancient classical romance, which after having been Célier, was no longer anything but Lodoiska, still noble, but ever more and more vulgar. Having fallen from Mademoiselle de Scudieri to Madame Bournon Malarme, and from Madame de Lafayette to Madame Barthélemy Hadot, was setting the loving hearts of the portresses of Paris aflame, and even ravaging the suburbs to some extent. Madame Thénardier was just intelligent enough to read this sort of books. She lived on them. In them she drowned what brains she possessed. This had given her, when very young, and even a little later, a sort of pensive attitude towards her husband, a scamp of a certain depth, a ruffian letter to the same extent of the grammar, coarse and fine at one in the same time. But so fine as sensationalism was concerned, given to the perusal of Pigault Lebrun, and in what concerns the sex, as he said in his jargon, a downright unmitigated lout. His wife was twelve or fifteen years younger than he was. Later on, when her hair, arranged in a romantically drooping fashion, began to grow gray, when the Megara began to be developed from the Pamela, the female Thénardier was nothing but a coarse, vicious woman who had dabbled in stupid romances. Now one cannot read nonsense with impunity. The result was that her eldest daughter was named Eponine. As for the younger, the poor little thing came near being called Galnaire. 
I know to what diversion, affected by a romance of Ducre du Menil, she owed the fact that she merely bore the name of Azelma. However, we will remark, by the way, everything was not ridiculous and superficial in that curious epoch to which we are alluding, and which may be designated as the anarchy of baptismal names. By the side of this romantic element which we have just indicated, there is the social symptom. It is not rare for the Nethard's boy nowadays to bear the name of Arthur, Alfred, or Alphonse, and for the Vicomte, if there are still any Vicomte, to be called Thomas, Pierre, or Jacques. This displacement, which places the elegant name on the plebeian and the rustic name on the aristocrat, is nothing else than an eddy of the quality. The irresistible penetration of the new inspiration is there as everywhere else. Beneath this apparent discord there is a great and profound thing, the French Revolution. End of Book 4, Chapter 2 Recording by Melissa Book Four, Chapter Three of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Fourth. To confide is sometimes to deliver into a person's power. Chapter Three. The Lark. It is not all in all sufficient to be wicked in order to prosper. The cook-shop was in a bad way. Thanks to the traveller's fifty-seven francs, Thénardier had been able to avoid a protest and to honour his signature. On the following month they were again in need of money. The woman took Cosette's outfit to Paris and pawned it at the pawnbroker's for sixty francs. As soon as that sum was spent, the Thénardier grew accustomed to look on the little girl merely as a child whom they were caring for out of charity, and they treated her accordingly. As she had no longer any clothes, they dressed her in the cast-off petticoats and chemises of the Thénardier brats, that is to say, in rags. They fed her on what all the rest had left, a little better than the dog, a little worse than the cat. Moreover, the cat and dog were her habitual table companions. Cosette ate with them under the table from a wooden bowl similar to theirs. The mother, who had established herself, as we shall see later on, Montreux sur mer wrote, or more correctly caused to be written, a letter every month that she might have news of her child. The Thénardier replied invariably, Cosette is doing wonderfully well. At the expiration of the first six months, the mother sent seven francs for the seven month, and continued her remittances with tolerable regularity from month to month. The year was not completed when Thénardier said, A fine favor she is doing us in sooth. What does she expect us to do with her seven francs? and he wrote to demand twelve francs. The mother, whom they had persuaded into the belief that her child was happy and was coming on well, submitted and forwarded the twelve francs. Certain natures cannot love on the one hand without hating on the other. Mother Thénardier loved her two daughters passionately, which caused her to hate the stranger. It is sad to think that the love of a mother can possess villainous aspects. Little as was the space occupied by Cosette, it seemed to her as though it were taken from her own, and that that little child diminished the air which her daughters breathed. This woman, like many women of her sort, had a load of caresses and a burden of blows and injuries to dispense each day. If she had not had Cosette, it is certain that her daughters, idolized as they were, would have received the whole of it. But the stranger did them the service to divert the blows to herself. Her daughters received nothing but caresses. Cosette could not make a motion which would not draw down upon her head a heavy shower of violent blows, an unmerited chastisement. The sweet, feeble being, who should not have understood anything of this world or of God, incessantly punished, scolded, ill-used, beaten, and seeing beside her two little creatures like herself, who lived in a ray of dawn. Madame Thénardier was vicious with Cosette. A Pianine and Azelma were vicious. Children at that age are only copies of their mother. The size is smaller, that is all. A year passed, then another. People in the village said, Those Thénardier are good people. They are not rich, and yet they are bringing up a poor child who was abandoned on their hands. They thought that Cosette's mother had forgotten her. In the meanwhile, Thénardier, having learned, it was impossible to say by what obscure means, that the child was probably a bastard, and that the mother could not acknowledge it, exacted fifteen francs a month, saying that the creature was growing and eating, and threatened to send her away. 
Let her not bother me, he exclaimed, or I'll fire her brat right into the middle of her secrets. I must have an increase. The mother paid the fifteen franc. From year to year the child grew, and so did her wretchedness. As long as Cosette was little, she was the scapegoat of the two other children. As soon as she began to develop a little, that is to say, before she was even five years old, she became the servant of the household. Five years old, the reader will say, that is not probable. Alas, it is true. Social suffering begins at all ages. Have we not recently seen the trial of a man named Domalar, an orphan turned bandit, who at the age of five, as the official documents state, being alone in the world, worked for his living and stole? Cosette was made to run on errands, to sweep the rooms, the courtyard, the street, to wash the dishes, to even carry burdens. The Thénardier considered themselves all the more authorized to behave in this manner, since the mother, who was still at montreuil sur mer had become irregular in her payments. Some months she was in arrears. If this mother had returned to Montfermeil at the end of these three years, she would not have recognized her child. Cosette, so pretty and rosy on her arrival in that house, was now thin and pale. She had an indescribably uneasy look. The sly creature, said the Thénardier. Injustice had made her peevish, and misery had made her ugly. Nothing remained to her except her beautiful eyes, which inspired pain, because large as they were, it seemed as though one beheld in them a still larger amount of sadness. It was a heart-breaking thing to see this poor child, not yet six years old, shivering in the winter in her old rags of linen, full of holes, sweeping the street before daylight, with an enormous broom in her tiny red hands and a tear in her great eyes. She was called the Lark in the neighborhood. The populace, who are fond of these figures of speech, had taken a fancy to bestow this name on this trembling, frightened, and shivering little creature, no bigger than a bird, who was awake every morning before any one else in the house or the village, and was always in the street or the fields before daybreak. Only the little Lark never sang. End of Book Four, Chapter Three Recording by Melissa Book 5, Chapter 1 of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joel Portinga. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book the Fifth, The Descent. Chapter 1, The History of a Progress in Black Glass Trinkets. And in the meantime, what had become of that mother, who, according to the people at Montfermé, seemed to have abandoned her child? Where was she? What was she doing? After leaving her little Cosette with the Thénardiers, she had continued her journey, and had reached Montreuil-sur-Mer. This, it will be remembered, was in 1818. Fantine had quitted her province ten years before. Montreuil-sur-Mer had changed its aspect. While Fantine had been slowly descending from wretchedness to wretchedness, her native town had prospered. About two years previously, one of those industrial facts which are the grand events of small districts had taken place. This detail is important, and we regard it as useful to develop it at length, we should almost say to underline it. From time immemorial, Montreuil-sur-Mer had had for its special industry the imitation of English jet and the black glass trinkets of Germany. This industry had always vegetated on account of the high price of the raw material, which reacted on the manufacture. At the moment when Fantine returned to Montreuil-sur-Mer, an unheard-of transformation had taken place in the production of black goods. Towards the close of 1815, a man, a stranger had established himself in the town, and had been inspired with the idea of substituting, in this manufacture, gum lac for resin, and, for bracelets in particular, slides of sheet iron simply laid together for slides of soldered sheet iron. This very small change had effected a revolution. This very small change had, in fact, prodigiously reduced the cost of the raw material, which had rendered it possible in the first place to raise the price of manufacture a benefit to the country, in the second place, to improve the workmanship, an advantage to the consumer, in the third place, to sell at a lower price while trebling the profit, which was a benefit to the manufacturer. Thus three results ensued from one idea. 
In less than three years the inventor of this process had become rich, which is good, and had made everyone about him rich, which is better. He was a stranger in the department. Of his origin nothing was known. Of the beginning of his career very little. It was rumored that he had come to town with very little money, a few hundred francs at the most. It was from this slender capital, enlisted in the service of an ingenious idea, developed by method and thought, that he had drawn his own fortune, and the fortune of the whole countryside. On his arrival at Montreuil-sur-Mer, he had only the garments, the appearance, and the language of a working man. It appears that on the very day when he made his obscure entry into the little town of Montreuil-sur-Mer, just at nightfall, on a December evening, knapsack on back and thorn club in hand, a large fire had broken out in the town hall. This man had rushed into the flames and saved, at the risk of his own life, two children who belonged to the captain of the gendarmerie. This is why they had forgotten to ask him for his passport. Afterwards, they had learned his name. He was called Father Madeleine. End of Book 5, Chapter 1《Book Five, Chapter Two of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Joel Portinga. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo. Book Five, The Descent, Chapter Two, Madeleine. He was a man about fifty years of age who had a preoccupied air and who was good. That was all that could be said about him. Thanks to the rapid progress of the industry which he had so admirably reconstructed, Montreuil-sur-Mer had become a rather important center of trade. Spain, which consumes a good deal of black jet, made enormous purchases there each year. Montreuil-sur-Mer almost rivaled London and Berlin in this branch of commerce. Father Madeleine's profits were such that at the end of the second year he was able to erect a large factory, in which there were two vast workrooms, one for the men and the other for women. Anyone who was hungry could present himself there and was sure of finding employment and bread. Father Madeleine required of the men good will, and of the women pure morals, and of all probity. He had separated the workrooms in order to separate the sexes, and so that the women and girls might remain discreet. On this point he was inflexible. It was the only thing in which he was, in a manner, intolerant. He was all the more firmly set on this severity, since Montreuil-sur-Mer, being a garrison town, opportunities for corruption abounded. However, his coming had been a boon, and his presence was a godsend. Before Father Madeleine's arrival, everything had languished in the country. Now everything lived with a healthy life of toil. A strong circulation warmed everything and penetrated everywhere. Slack seasons and wretchedness were unknown. There was no pocket so obscure that it had not a little money in it, no dwelling so lowly that there was not some little joy within it. Father Madeleine gave employment to everyone. He exacted but one thing. Be an honest man. Be an honest woman. As we have said, in the midst of this activity, of which he was the cause and the pivot, Father Madeleine made his fortune, but a singular thing in a simple man of business, it did not seem as though that were his chief care. He appeared to be thinking much of others, and little of himself. In 1820 he was known to have a sum of 630,000 francs lodged in his name with Lafitte, but before reserving these 630,000 francs, he had spent more than a million for the town and its poor. The hospital was badly endowed. He founded six beds there. Montreuil-sur-Mer is divided into the upper and the lower town. The lower town, in which he lived, had but one school, a miserable hovel, which was falling to ruin. He constructed two, one for girls, the other for boys. He allotted a salary from his own funds to the two instructors, a salary twice as large as their meagre official salary, and one day he said to someone who expressed surprise, the two prime functionaries of the state are the nurse and the schoolmaster. He created at his own expense an infant school, a thing then almost unknown in France, and a fund for aiding old and infirm workmen. 
as his factory was a center, a new quarter, in which there were a good many indigent families, rose rapidly around him. He established there a free dispensary. At first, when they watched his beginnings, the good souls said, He's a jolly fellow who means to get rich. When they saw him enriching the country before he enriched himself, the good souls said, He is an ambitious man. This seemed all the more probable since the man was religious, and even practiced his religion to a certain degree, a thing which was very favorably viewed on at that epoch. He went regularly to low mass every Sunday. The local deputy, who knows doubt all rivalry everywhere, soon began to grow uneasy over this religion. This deputy had been a member of the legislative body of the empire, and shared the religious ideas of a father of the oratoire, known under the name of Fouche, Duc d'Entrante, whose creature and friend he had been. He indulged in gentle raillery at God with closed doors. But when he beheld the wealthy manufacturer, Madeleine, going to low mass at seven o'clock, he perceived in him a possible candidate, and resolved to outdo him. He took a Jesuit confessor, and went to high mass and to vespers. Ambition was, at that time, in the direct acceptation of the word, a race to the steeple. The poor profited by this terror as well as the good God, for the honorable deputy also founded two beds in the hospital, which made twelve. Nevertheless, in 1819, a rumor one morning circulated through the town to the effect that, on the representations of the prefect, and in consideration of the services rendered by him to the country, Father Madeleine was to be appointed by the king, mayor of montreuil sur mer Those who had pronounced this newcomer to be an ambitious fellow, seized with delight on this opportunity which all men desire, to exclaim, There, what did we say? All montreuil sur mer was in an uproar. The rumor was well founded. Several days later, the appointment appeared in the Moniteur. On the following day, Father Madeleine refused. In the same year of 1819, the products of the new process invented by Madeleine figured in the industrial exhibition. When the jury made their report, the king appointed the inventor a chevalier of the Legion of Honor. A fresh excitement in the little town. Well, so it was the cross that he wanted. Father Madeleine refused the cross. Decidedly, this man was an enigma. The good souls got out of their predicament by saying, After all, he is some sort of an adventurer. We have seen that the country owed much to him. The poor owed him everything. He was so useful and he was so gentle that the people had been obliged to honor and respect him. His workmen, in particular, adored him, and he endured this adoration with a sort of melancholy gravity. When he was known to be rich, people in society bowed to him, and he received invitations in the town. He was called, in town, Monsieur Madeleine. His workmen and the children continued to call him Father Madeleine, and that was what was most adapted to make him smile. In proportion as he mounted, throve, invitations rained down upon him. Society claimed him for its own. The prim little drawing-rooms on montreuil sur mer which, of course, had at first been closed to the artisan, opened both leaves of their folding doors to the millionaire. They made a thousand advances to him. He refused. This time the good gossips had no trouble. He is an ignorant man of no education. No one knows where he came from. He would not know how to behave in society. It has not been absolutely proved that he knows how to read. When they saw him making money, they said, He's a man of business. When they saw him scattering his money about, they said, He is an ambitious man. When he was seen to decline honors, they said, He is an adventurer. When they saw him repulse society, they said, He is a brute. In 1820, five years after his arrival in Montreuil-sur-Mer, the services which he had rendered to the district were so dazzling, the opinion of the whole country round about was so unanimous, that the king again appointed him mayor of the town. He again declined, but the prefect resisted his refusal. All the notabilities of the place came to implore him. The people in the street besought him. The urging was so vigorous that he ended by accepting. It was noticed that the thing which seemed chiefly to bring him to a decision was the almost irritated apostrophe addressed to him by an old woman of the people, who called to him from her threshold in an angry way. A good mayor is a useful thing. Is he drawing back before the good which he can do? This was the third phase of his ascent. 
Father Madeleine had become Monsieur Madeleine. Monsieur Madeleine had become Monsieur le Maire. End of chapter 2「Book Five, Chapter Three of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joel Portinga. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Five, The Descent. Chapter Three, Sums Deposited with Lafitte. On the other hand, he remained as simple as on the first day. He had gray hair, a serious eye, the sunburned complexion of a laborer, the thoughtful visage of a philosopher. He habitually wore a hat with a wide brim, and a long coat of coarse cloth, buttoned to the chin. He fulfilled his duties as mayor, but, with that exception, he lived in solitude. He spoke to but few people. He avoided polite attentions. He escaped quickly. He smiled to relieve himself of the necessity of talking. He gave, in order to get rid of the necessity for smiling. The women said of him, What a good-natured bear! His pleasure consisted in strolling in the fields. He always took his meals alone, with an open book before him, which he read. He had a well-selected little library. He loved books. Books are cold but safe, friends. In proportion, as leisure came to him with fortune, he seemed to take advantage of it to cultivate his mind. It had been observed that, ever since his arrival at Montreuil-sur-Mer, his language had grown more polished, more choice, and more gentle with every passing year. He liked to carry a gun with him on his strolls, but he rarely made use of it. When he did happen to do so, his shooting was something so infallible as to inspire terror. He never killed an inoffensive animal. He never shot at a little bird. Although he was no longer young, it was thought that he was still prodigiously strong. He offered his assistance to anyone who was in need of it, lifted a horse, released a wheel clogged in the mud, or stopped a runaway bull by the horns. He always had his pocket full of money when he went out, but they were empty on his return. When he passed through a village, the ragged brats ran joyously after him and surrounded him like a swarm of gnats. It was thought that he must, in the past, have lived a country life, since he knew all sorts of useful secrets, which he taught to the peasants. He taught them how to destroy scurf on wheat, by sprinkling it and the granary, and inundating the cracks in the floor with a solution of common salt, and how to chase away weevils by hanging up orviate in bloom everywhere, on the walls and the ceilings, among the grass and in the houses. He had recipes for exterminating from a field blight, tares, foxtail, and all parasitic growths which destroy the wheat. He defended a rabbit warren against rats, simply by the odor of a guinea pig which he placed in it. One day he saw some country people busily engaged in pulling up nettles. He examined the plants, which were uprooted and already dried, and said, They are dead. Nevertheless, it would be a good thing to know how to make use of them. When the nettle is young, the leaf makes an excellent vegetable. When it is older, it has filaments and fibers like hemp and flax. Nettle cloth is as good as linen cloth. Chopped up, nettles are good for poultry. Pounded, they are good for horned cattle. The seed of the nettle, mixed with fodder, gives gloss to the hair of the animals. The root, mixed with salt, produces a beautiful yellow coloring matter. Moreover, it is an excellent hay, which can be cut twice. And what is required for the nettle? A little soil, no care, no culture. Only the seed falls as it is ripe, and it is difficult to collect it. That is all. With the exercise of a little care, the nettle could be made useful. It is neglected, and it becomes hurtful. It is exterminated. How many men resemble the nettle? He added, after a pause, Remember this, my friends. There are no such things as bad plants or bad men. There are only bad cultivators. The children loved him because he knew how to make charming little trifles of straw and coconuts. When he saw the door of a church hung in black, he entered. He sought out funerals as other men seek christenings. Widowhood and the grief of others attracted him because of his great gentleness. He mingled with the friends clad in mourning, with families dressed in black, with the priests groaning around a coffin. He seemed to like to give to his thoughts for text these funereal psalmodies filled with the vision of the other world. 
With his eyes fixed on heaven, he listened with a sort of aspiration towards all the mysteries of the infinite, those sad voices which sing on the verge of the obscure abyss of death. He performed a multitude of good actions, concealing his agency in them as a man conceals himself because of evil actions. He penetrated houses privately, at night. He ascended staircases furtively. A poor wretch, on returning to his attic, would find that his door had been opened, sometimes even forced, during his absence. The poor man made a clamor over it. Some malefactor had been there. He entered, and the first thing he beheld was a piece of gold lying forgotten on some piece of furniture. The malefactor, who had been there, was Father Madeleine. He was affable and sad. The people said, There is a rich man who has not a haughty air. There is a happy man who has not a contented air. Some people maintained that he was a mysterious person, and that no one ever entered his chamber, which was a regular anchorite cell, furnished with winged hour-glasses and enlivened by crossbones and skulls of dead men. This was much talked of, so that one of the elegant and malicious young women of Montreuil-sur-Mer came to him one day and asked, Monsieur le maire, pray show us your chamber. It is said to be a grotto. He smiled and introduced them instantly into this grotto. They were well punished for their curiosity. The room was very simply furnished in mahogany, which was rather ugly, like all furniture of that sort, and hung with paper worth twelve sous. They could see nothing remarkable about it, except two candlesticks of antique pattern which stood on the chimney-piece and appeared to be silver, for they were hallmarked, an observation full of the type of wit of petty towns. Nevertheless, people continued to say that no one ever got into the room, and that it was a hermit's cave, a mysterious retreat, a hole, a tomb. It was also whispered about that he had immense sums deposited with Lafitte, with this particular feature that they were always at his immediate disposal, so that, it was added, Monsieur Madeleine could make his appearance at Lafitte's any morning, sign a receipt, and carry off his two or three millions in ten minutes. In reality, these two or three millions were reducible, as we have said, to six hundred and thirty or forty thousand francs. End of Book 5, Chapter 3「Book Five, Chapter Four of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joel Portinga. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Five, The Descent. Chapter Four, Madeleine in Mourning. At the beginning of 1820, the newspapers announced the death of Monsieur Muriel, Bishop of Digne, surnamed Monseigneur Bienvenu, who had died in the odor of sanctity at the age of 82. The Bishop of Digne, to supply here a detail which the papers omitted, had been blind for many years before his death, and content to be blind, as his sister was beside him. Let us remark, by the way, that to be blind and to be loved is, in fact, one of the most strangely exquisite forms of happiness upon this earth, where nothing is complete. To have continually at one side a woman, a daughter, a sister, a charming being, who is there because you need her and because she cannot do without you, to know that we are indispensable to a person who is necessary to us, to be able to incessantly measure one's affection by the amount of her presence which she bestows on us, and to say to ourselves, since she consecrates the whole of her time to me, it is because I possess the whole of her heart. To behold her thought in lieu of her face, to be able to verify the fidelity of one being amid the eclipse of the world, to regard the rustle of a gown as the sound of wings, to hear her come and go, retire, speak, return, sing, and to think that one is the center of these steps, of this speech, to manifest at each instant one's personal attraction, to feel oneself all the more powerful because of one's infirmity, to become in one's obscurity, and through one's obscurity, the star around which this angel gravitates. Few felicities equal this. The supreme happiness of life consists in the conviction that one is loved, loved for one's own sake, let us say rather, loved in spite of one's self. This conviction the blind man possesses. To be served in distress is to be caressed. Does he lack anything? No. 
one does not lose the sight when one has love. And what love? A love wholly constituted of virtue. There is no blindness where there is certainty. Soul seeks soul, gropingly, and finds it. And this soul, found and tested, is a woman. A hand sustains you, it is hers. A mouth lightly touches your brow, it is her mouth. You hear a breath very near you, it is hers. To have everything of her, from her worship to her pity, never to be left, to have that sweet weakness aiding you, to lean upon that immovable reed, to touch providence with one's hands, and to be able to take it in one's arms. God made tangible. What bliss! The heart, that obscure celestial flower, undergoes a mysterious blossoming. One would not exchange that shadow for all brightness. The angel soul is there, uninterruptedly there. If she departs, it is but to return again. She vanishes like a dream, and reappears like reality. One feels warmth approaching, and behold, she is there. One overflows with serenity, with gaiety, with ecstasy. One is a radiance amid the night, and there are a thousand little cares. Nothings, which are enormous in that void. The most ineffable accents of the feminine voice employed to lull you, and supplying the vanished universe to you. One is caressed with the soul. One sees nothing, but one feels that one is adored. It is a paradise of shadows. It was from this paradise that Monseigneur Welcome had passed to the other. The announcement of his death was reprinted by the local journal of Montreuil-sur-Mer. On the following day, Monsieur Madeleine appeared clad wholly in black and with crepe on his hat. This morning was noticed in the town and commented on. It seemed to throw light on Monsieur Madeleine's origin. It was concluded that some relationship existed between him and the venerable bishop. "'He has gone into mourning for the bishop of Digne,' said the drawing-rooms. This raised Monsieur Madeleine's credit greatly, and procured for him, instantly and at one blow, a certain consideration in that noble world of Montreuil-sur-Mer. The microscopic Faubourg Saint-Germain of the place meditated raising the quarantine against Monsieur Madeleine, the probable relative of a bishop. Monsieur Madeleine perceived the advancement which he had obtained by the more numerous courtesies of the old women and the more plentiful smiles of the young ones. One evening, a ruler in that petty great world, who was curious by right of seniority, ventured to ask him, Monsieur le maire is doubtless a cousin of the late bishop of Digne. He said, No, madame. But, resumed the dowager, you are wearing mourning for him. He replied, It is because I was a servant in his family in my youth. Another thing which was remarked was that every time that he encountered in the town a young Savoyard who was roaming about the country and seeking chimneys to sweep, the mayor had him summoned, inquired his name, and gave him money. The little Savoyards told each other about it. A great many of them passed that way. End of Book 5, Chapter 2《Book V, Chapter V of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joel Portinga. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book V, The Descent. Chapter V, Vague Flashes on the Horizon. Little by little, and in the course of time, all this opposition subsided. There had at first been exercised against Monsieur Madeleine, in virtue of a sort of law which all those who rise must submit to, blackening and calumnies. Then they grew to be nothing more than ill nature, then merely malicious remarks, then even this entirely disappeared. Respect became complete, unanimous, cordial, and towards 1821 the moment arrived when the word Monsieur le maire was pronounced at Montreuil-sur-Mer with almost the same accent as Monseigneur the Bishop had been pronounced in Digne in 1815. People came from a distance of ten leagues around to consult Monsieur Madeleine. He put an end to differences, he prevented lawsuits, he reconciled enemies. Everyone took him for the judge, and with good reason. It seemed as though he had for a soul the book of the natural law. 
It was like an epidemic of veneration, which in the course of six or seven years gradually took possession of the whole district. One single man in the town, in the arrondissement, absolutely escaped this contagion, and, whatever Father Madeleine did, remained his opponent as though a sort of incorruptible and imperturbable instinct kept him on the alert and uneasy. It seems, in fact, as though there existed in certain men a veritable bestial instinct, though pure and upright, like all instincts, which creates antipathies and sympathies, which fatally separates one nature from another nature, which does not hesitate, which feels no disquiet, which does not hold its peace, which never belies itself, clear in its obscurity, infallible, imperious, intractable, stubborn to all counsels of the intelligence and to all the dissolvents of reason, and which, in whatever manner destinies are arranged, secretly warns the man-dog of the presence of the man-cat, and the man-fox of the presence of the man-lion. It frequently happened that when Monsieur Madeleine was passing along a street, calm, affectionate, surrounded by the blessings of all, a man of lofty stature, clad in an iron-gray frock coat, armed with a heavy cane and wearing a battered hat, turned round abruptly behind him, and followed him with his eyes until he disappeared with folded arms and a slow shake of the head, and his upper lip raised in company with his lower to his nose, a sort of significant grimace which might be translated by, "'What is that man, after all? I certainly have seen him somewhere.' In any case, I am not his dupe. This person, grave with a gravity which was almost menacing, was one of those men who, even when only seen by a rapid glimpse, arrest the spectator's attention. His name was Javert, and he belonged to the police. At Montreuil-sur-Mer, he exercised the unpleasant but useful functions of an inspector. He had not seen Madeleine's beginnings. Javert owed the post which he occupied to the protection of Monsieur Chabouillet, the secretary of the Minister of State, Comte Anglais, then prefect of police at Paris. When Javert arrived at Montreuil-sur-Mer, the fortune of the great manufacturer was already made, and Father Madeleine had become Monsieur Madeleine. Certain police officers have a peculiar physiognomy, which is complicated with an air of baseness mingled with an air of authority. Javert possessed this physiognomy, minus the baseness. It is our conviction that if souls were visible to the eyes, we should be able to see distinctly that strange thing that each one individual of the human race corresponds to one of the species of the animal creation, and we could easily recognize this truth, hardly perceived by the thinker, that from the oyster to the eagle, from the pig to the tiger, all animals exist in man, and that each one of them is in a man, sometimes even several of them at a time. Animals are nothing else than the figures of our virtues and our vices, straying before our eyes, the visible phantoms of our souls. God shows them to us in order to induce us to reflect. Only since animals are mere shadows, God has not made them capable of education in the full sense of the word. What is the use? On the contrary, our souls being realities and having a goal which is appropriate to them, God has bestowed on them intelligence, that is to say, the possibility of education. Social education, when well done, can always draw from a soul, of whatever sort it may be, the utility which it contains. This, be it said, is of course from the restricted point of view of the terrestrial life which is apparent and without prejudging the profound question of the anterior or ulterior personality of the beings which are not man. The visible eye in no wise authorizes the thinker to deny the latent eye. Having made this reservation, let us pass on. Now, if the reader will admit, for a moment with us, that in every man there is one of the animal species of creation, it will be easy for us to say that there was, in police officer Javert, the peasants of the Asturias are convinced that in every litter of wolves there is one dog which is killed by the mother because, otherwise, as he grew up, he would devour the other little ones. Give to this dog son of a wolf a human face, and the result will be Javert. Javert had been born in prison of a fortune-teller whose husband was in the galleys, 
As he grew up, he thought he was outside the pale of society, and he despaired of ever re-entering it. He observed that society unpardoningly excludes two classes of men, those who attack it and those who guard it. He had no choice except between these two classes. At the same time, he was conscious of an indescribable foundation of rigidity, regularity, and probity, complicated with an inexpressible hatred for the race of bohemians whence he was sprung. He entered the police. He succeeded there. At forty years of age, he was an inspector. During his youth, he had been employed in the convict establishments of the South. Before proceeding further, let us come to an understanding as to these words, human face, which we have just applied to Javert. The human face of Javert consisted of a flat nose with two deep nostrils, towards which enormous whiskers ascended on his cheeks. One felt ill at ease when he saw these two forests and these two caverns for the first time. When Javert laughed, and his laugh was rare and terrible, his thin lips parted and revealed to view not only his teeth, but his gums, and around his nose there formed a flattened and savage fold, as on the muzzle of a wild beast. Javert, serious, was a watchdog. When he laughed he was like a tiger. As for the rest, he had very little skull and a great deal of jaw. His hair concealed his forehead and fell over his eyebrows. Between his eyes there was a permanent central frown, like an imprint of wrath. His gaze was obscure, his mouth pursed up and terrible, his air that of ferocious command. This man was composed of two very simple and two very good sentiments, comparatively, but he rendered them almost bad by dint of exaggerating them. Respect for authority, hatred of rebellion, and in his eyes, murder, robbery, all crimes are only forms of rebellion. He enveloped in a blind and profound faith everyone who had a function in the state, from the prime minister to the rural policeman. He covered with scorn, aversion, and disgust every one who had once crossed the legal threshold of evil. He was absolute, and admitted no exceptions. On the one hand, he said, the functionary can make no mistake, the magistrate is never the wrong. On the other hand, he said, these men are irremediably lost, nothing good can come from them. He fully shared the opinion of those extreme minds which attribute to human law I know not what power of making, or if the reader will have it so, of authenticating demons, and who place a stick at the base of society. He was stoical, serious, austere, a melancholy dreamer, humble and haughty, like fanatics. His glance was like a gimlet, cold and piercing. His whole life hung on these two words, watchfulness and supervision. He had introduced a straight line into what is the most crooked thing in the world. He possessed the conscience of his usefulness, the religion of his functions, and he was a spy as other men are priests. Woe to the man who fell into his hands. He would have arrested his own father if the latter had escaped from the galleys, and would have denounced his mother if she had broken her ban. And he would have done it with that sort of inward satisfaction which is conferred by virtue. And, withal, a life of privation, isolation, abnegation, chastity, with never a diversion. It was implacable duty. The police understood, as the Spartans understood Sparta, a pitiless lying in wait, a ferocious honesty, a marble informer, Brutus in Vidocq. Javert's whole person was expressive of the man who spies and who withdraws himself from observation. The mystical school of Joseph de Maistre, which at that epoch seasoned with lofty cosmogony those things which were called the ultra-newspapers, would not have failed to declare that Javert was a symbol. His brow was not visible, it disappeared beneath his hat. His eyes were not visible, since they were lost under his eyebrows. His chin was not visible, for it was plunged in his cravat. His hands were not visible, they were drawn up in his sleeves. And his cane was not visible, he carried it under his coat. But when the occasion presented itself, there was suddenly seen to emerge from all this shadow, as from an ambuscade, a narrow and angular forehead, a baleful glance, a threatening chin, enormous hands, and a monstrous cudgel. In his leisure moments, which were far from frequent, he read, 
although he hated books. This caused him to be not wholly illiterate. This could be recognized by some emphasis in his speech. As we have said, he had no vices. When he was pleased with himself, he permitted himself a pinch of snuff. Therein lay his connection with humanity. The reader will have no difficulty in understanding that Javert was the terror of that whole class which the annual statistics of the Ministry of Justice designates under the rubric vagrants. The name of Javert routed them by its mere utterance. The face of Javert petrified them at sight. Such was this formidable man. Javert was like an eye constantly fixed on Monsieur Madeleine, an eye full of suspicion and conjecture. Monsieur Madeleine had finally perceived the fact, but it seemed to be of no importance to him. He did not even put a question to Javert. He neither sought nor avoided him. He bore that embarrassing and almost oppressive gaze without appearing to notice it. He treated Javert with ease and courtesy, as he did all the rest of the world. It was divined, from some words which escaped Javert, that he had secretly investigated, with that curiosity which belongs to the race, and into which there enters as much instinct as will, all the anterior traces which Father Madeleine might have left elsewhere. He seemed to know, and he sometimes said in covert words, that someone had gleaned certain information in a certain district about a family which had disappeared. Once he chanced to say, as he was talking to himself, I think I have him. Then he remained pensive for three days, and uttered not a word. It seemed that the thread which he thought he held had broken. Moreover, and this furnishes the necessary corrective for the too absolute sense which certain words might present, there can be nothing really infallible in a human creature, and the peculiarity of instinct is that it can be confused, thrown off the track, and defeated. Otherwise it would be superior to intelligence, and the beast would be found to be provided with a better light than man. Javert was evidently somewhat disconcerted by the perfect naturalness and tranquillity of Monsieur Madeleine. One day, nevertheless, his strange manner appeared to produce an impression on Monsieur Madeleine. It was on the following occasion. End of chapter 5《Book Five, Chapter Six of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joel Portinga. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo, Book Five, The Descent, Chapter Six, Father Fauchelevent. One morning, Monsieur Madeleine was passing through an unpaved alley of Montreuil-sur-Mer. He heard a noise and saw a group some distance away. He approached. An old man named Father Fauchelevent had just fallen beneath his cart, his horse having tumbled down. This Fauchelevent was one of the few enemies whom Monsieur Madeleine had at that time. When Madeleine arrived in the neighborhood, Fauchelevent, an ex-notary and a peasant who was almost educated, had a business which was beginning to be in a bad way. Fauchelevent had seen this simple workman grow rich, while he, a lawyer, was being ruined. This had filled him with jealousy, and he had done all he could, on every occasion, to injure Madeleine. Then bankruptcy had come, and as the old man had nothing left but a cart and a horse, and neither family nor children, he had turned carter. The horse had two broken legs and could not rise. The old man was caught in the wheels. The fall had been so unlucky that the whole weight of the vehicle rested on his breast. The cart was quite heavily laden. Father Fauchelevent was rattling in the throat in the most lamentable manner. They had tried, but in vain, to drag him out. An unmethodical effort, aid awkwardly given, a wrong shake might kill him. It was impossible to disengage him otherwise than by lifting the vehicle off of him. Javert, who had come up at the moment of the accident, had sent for a jack screw. Monsieur Madeleine arrived. People stood aside respectfully. Help! cried old Fauchelevent. Who will be good and save the old man? Monsieur Madeleine turned towards those present. Is there a jack screw to be had? One has been sent for, answered the peasant. 
How long will it take to get it? They have gone for the market to Flachot's place, where there is a farrier, but it makes no difference. It will take a good quarter of an hour. A quarter of an hour! exclaimed Madeleine. It had rained on the preceding night. The soil was soaked. The cart was sinking deeper into the earth every moment and crushing the old carter's breast more and more. It was evident that his ribs would be broken in five minutes more. "'It is impossible to wait another quarter of an hour,' said Madeleine to the peasants, who were staring at him. "'We must. But it will be too late, then. Don't you see that the cart is sinking?' "'Well?' "'Listen,' resumed Madeleine. "'There is still room enough under the cart to allow a man to crawl beneath it and raise it with his back. Only half a minute, and the poor man can be taken out. Is there any one here who has stout loins and heart? There are five louis d'or to be earned.' Not a man in the group stirred. Ten louis, said Madeleine. The persons present dropped their eyes. One of them muttered, A man would need to be devilish strong, and then he runs the risk of getting crushed. Come, began Madeleine again. Twenty louis. The same silence. It is not the will which is lacking, said a voice. Monsieur Madeleine turned round and recognized Javert. He had not noticed him on his arrival. Javert went on. It is strength. One would have to be a terrible man to do such a thing as lift a cart like that on his back. Then, gazing fixedly at Monsieur Madeleine, he went on, emphasizing every word that he uttered. Monsieur Madeleine, I have never known but one man capable of doing what you ask. Madeleine shuddered. Javert added with an air of indifference, but without removing his eyes from Madeleine. He was a convict. Ah, said Madeleine, in the galleys at Toulon. Madeleine turned pale. Meanwhile, the cart continued to sink slowly. Father Fauchelevent rattled in the throat and shrieked, I'm strangling! My ribs are breaking! A screw! Something! Ah! Madeleine glanced about him. Is there, then, no one who wishes to earn twenty louis and save the life of this poor old man? No one stirred. Javert resumed. I have never known but one man who could take the place of a screw, and he was that convict. Ah! It is crushing me! cried the old man. Madeleine raised his head, met Javert's falcon eyes still fixed upon him, and looked at the motionless peasants, and smiled sadly. Then, without saying a word, he fell on his knees, and before the crowd had even time to utter a cry, he was underneath the vehicle. A terrible moment of expectation and silence ensued. They beheld Madeleine, almost flat on his stomach beneath that terrible weight, make two vain efforts to bring his knees and his elbows together. They shouted to him, "'Father Madeleine, come out!' Old Fauchelevent himself said to him, "'Monsieur Madeleine, go away! You see that I am fated to die! Leave me! You will get yourself crushed also!' Madeleine made no reply. All the spectators were panting. The wheels had continued to sink, and it had become almost impossible for Madeleine to make his way from under the vehicle. Suddenly the enormous mass was seen to quiver. The cart rose slowly, the wheels half emerged from the ruts. They heard a stifled voice crying, "'Make haste! Help!' It was Madeleine who had just made a final effort. They rushed forwards. The devotion of a single man had given force and courage to all. The cart was raised by twenty arms. Old Fauchelevent was saved. Madeleine rose. He was pale, though dripping with perspiration. His clothes were torn and covered with mud. All wept. The old man kissed his knees and called him the good God. As for him, he bore upon his countenance an indescribable expression of happy and celestial suffering, and he fixed his tranquil eye on Javert, who was still staring at him. End of chapter 6Book 5, Chapter 7 of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman Les Miserables, 
by Victor Hugo. Book Five, The Descent. Chapter Seven, Fauchelevent becomes a gardener in Paris. Fauchelevent had dislocated his knee pan in his fall. Father Madeleine had him conveyed to an infirmary, which he had established for his workmen in the factory building itself, and which was served by two sisters of charity. On the following morning, the old man found a thousand-franc banknote on his nightstand, with these words in Father Madeleine's writing, I purchase your horse and cart. The cart was broken, and the horse was dead. Fauchelevent recovered, but his knee remained stiff. Monsieur Madeleine, on the recommendation of the Sisters of Charity and of his priest, got the good man a place as gardener in a female convent in the Rue Saint-Antoine in Paris. Some time afterwards, Monsieur Madeleine was appointed mayor. The first time that Javert beheld Monsieur Madeleine clothed in the scarf which gave him authority over the town, he felt the sort of shudder which a watchdog might experience on smelling a wolf in his master's clothes. From that time forth he avoided him as much as he possibly could. When the requirements of the service imperatively demanded it, and he could not do otherwise than meet the mayor, he addressed him with profound respect. This prosperity created at montreuil sur mer by Father Madeleine had, besides the visible signs which we have mentioned, another symptom which was none the less significant for not being visible. This never deceives. When the population suffers, when work is lacking, when there is no commerce, the taxpayer resists imposts through penury, he exhausts and oversteps his respite, and the state expends a great deal of money in the charges for compelling and collection. When work is abundant, when the country is rich and happy, the taxes are paid easily, and cost the state nothing. It may be said that there is one infallible thermometer of the public misery and riches, the cost of collecting the taxes. In the course of seven years, the expense of collecting the taxes had diminished three-fourths in the arrondissement of montreuil sur mer and this led to this arrondissement being frequently cited from all the rest by Monsieur de Villel, then Minister of Finance. Such was the condition of the country when Fantine returned thither. No one remembered her. Fortunately, the door of Monsieur Madeleine's factory was like the face of a friend. She presented herself there, and was admitted to the women's workroom. The trade was entirely new to Fantine. She could not be very skillful at it, and she therefore earned but little by her day's work. But it was sufficient. The problem was solved. She was earning her living. End of Book 5, Chapter 7Book 5, Chapter 8 of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zachary Brewster Geis. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book 5, The Descent. Chapter 8. Madame Vitournien expends thirty francs on morality. When Fantine saw that she was making her living, she felt joyful for a moment. To live honestly by her own labor, what mercy from heaven! The taste for work had really returned to her. She bought a looking-glass, took pleasure in surveying in it her youth, her beautiful hair, her fine teeth. She forgot many things. She thought only of Cosette and of the possible future and was almost happy. She hired a little room and furnished on credit on the strength of her future work, a lingering trace of her improvident ways. 
As she was not able to say that she was married, she took good care, as we have seen, not to mention her little girl. At first, as the reader has seen, she paid the Thénardier promptly. As she only knew how to sign her name, she was obliged to write through a public letter-writer. She wrote often, and this was noticed. It began to be said in an undertone in the women's workroom that Fantine wrote letters, and that she had ways about her. There is no one for spying on people's actions like those who are not concerned in them. Why does that gentleman never come except at nightfall? Why does Mr. So-and-so never hang his key on its nail on Tuesday? Why does he always take the narrow streets? Why does Madame always descend from her hackney coach before reaching her house? Why does she send out to purchase six sheets of notepaper when she has a whole stationer's shop full of it, etc.? There exist beings who, for the sake of obtaining the key to these enigmas, which are, moreover, of no consequence whatever to them, spend more money, waste more time, take more trouble, than would be required for ten good actions, and that gratuitously, for their own pleasure, without receiving any other payment for their curiosity than curiosity. They will follow up such and such a man or woman for whole days. They will do sentry duty for hours at a time on the corners of the streets, under alleyway doors at night in cold and rain. They will bribe errand porters. They will make the drivers of hackney coaches and lackeys tipsy, buy a waiting maid, suborn a porter. Why? For no reason. A pure passion for seeing, knowing, and penetrating into things, a pure itch for talking. And often these secrets once known, these mysteries made public, these enigmas illuminated by the light of day, bring on catastrophes, duels, failures, the ruin of families and broken lives, to the great joy of those who have found out everything, without any interest in the matter, and by pure instinct, a sad thing. Certain persons are malicious solely through a necessity for talking. Their conversation, the chat of the drawing-room, gossip of the ante-room, is like those chimneys which consume wood rapidly. They need a great amount of combustibles, and their combustibles are furnished by their neighbors. So Fantine was watched. In addition, many a one was jealous of her golden hair and of her white teeth. It was remarked that in the workroom she often turned aside in the midst of the rest to wipe away a tear. These were the moments when she was thinking of her child, perhaps also of the man whom she had loved. Breaking the gloomy bonds of the past is a mournful task. It was observed that she wrote twice a month at least, and that she paid the carriage on the letter. They managed to obtain the address, Monsieur, Monsieur Talnardier, innkeeper at Montfermé. The public writer, a good old man who could not fill his stomach with red wine without emptying his pocket of secrets, was made to talk in the wine shop. In short, it was discovered that Fantine had a child. She must be a pretty sort of a woman. An old gossip was found, who made the trip to Montfermeil, talked to the Thénardier, and said on her return, For my five and thirty francs I have freed my mind, I have seen the child. The gossip who did this thing was a gorgon named Madame Victorien, the guardian and doorkeeper of everyone's virtue. Madame Victorien was fifty-six, and reinforced the mask of ugliness with the mask of age. A quavering voice, a whimsical mind. This old dame had once been young, astonishing fact. In her youth, in ninety-three, she had married a monk who had fled from his cloister in a red cap, and passed from the Benaldines to the Jacobins. She was dry, rough, peevish, sharp, captious, almost venomous all this in memory of her monk, whose widow she was, and who had ruled over her masterfully and bent her to his will. She was a nettle in which the rustle of the cassock was visible. At the restoration she had turned bigot, and that with so much energy that the priests had forgiven her her monk. She had a small property, which she bequeathed with much ostentation to her religious community. She was in high favor at the Episcopal Palace of Arras. So this Madame Victorien went to Montfermé, and returned with the remark, I have seen the child. All this took time. Fantine had been at the factory for more than a year when, one morning, 
the superintendent of the workroom handed her fifty francs from the mayor, told her that she was no longer employed in the shop, and requested her, in the mayor's name, to leave the neighborhood. This was the very month when the Thénardier, after having demanded twelve francs instead of six, had just exacted fifteen francs instead of twelve. Fantine was overwhelmed. She could not leave the neighborhood. She was in debt for her rent and furniture. Fifty francs was not sufficient to cancel this debt. She stammered a few supplicating words. The superintendent ordered her to leave the shop on the instant. Besides, Fantine was only a moderately good workwoman. Overcome with shame even more than with despair, she quitted the shop and returned to her room. So her fault was now known to everyone. She no longer felt strong enough to say a word. She was advised to see the mayor. She did not dare. The mayor had given her fifty francs because he was good, and had dismissed her because he was just. She bowed before the decision. End of Book 5, Chapter 8 Recording by Zachary Brewstergeis, Greenbelt, Maryland, June 2007